the social side here to start off with. All right, I call the 50s, but 50s are not just the 1950s. I'm kind of making, I've stretched the years from 1945 to 1963. Now, what's significant about 1945? Okay, the end of the war. Now, what's about 63? And that is where with JFK for assassinated. So, and, you, and, kind of, and this is where you have to realize a lot of times, what a lot of you think of the 60s is the late 60s, early 70s. What a lot of you think of the 1970s, where the disco age is the late 70s, the early 80s. Um, so, so again, it's, just, it's not like people just change attitudes once you change from 1969 to 1970 um, in that way. But JFK's assassination, I kind of like to use that as it. For one thing, where for America, in many ways you can kind of say that we had an innocence to us that well, was kind of blown away with JFK. Um, all right, the baby boom. All right, what's the baby boom? Which one baby born? Yeah, we had a whole bunch of children that were born. Um, if you look, and here's where for different graphs, you see this jump in the number of babies born each year. Why? So people were more settled in and they're like happier and they're more Okay. Well, and all you're saying is actually actually right. World War II ended. Okay. Then you're all fighting, right? Ben yeah. comes back from the know. war. He gets with his second wife, because Jessica's off with, with Trey. So he he now gets a second wife. Um, here. But he wants to make up for some time. Probably a little more mature after he's been fighting on there. Were there some people that did not have as many children during the Great Depression because they did not have as much money? So that, I mean, it's, it's a co combination of factors. It's not just because the war ended. It's not just because of the Depression. It's not just because of money. But all of those things kind of coming together at one time. Um, and for this generation, like when you hear of people that say they're baby boomers, all right, the baby boomers, um, most of the times the age that's done is people that were born between 1945 and actually 63 or 64 is usually the cutoff age. Which, that sometimes could be people that are, a, like my mother and my oldest sister both are considered baby boomers because they both were born during that time period. Um, there. So, I mean, that's, yeah, they were applied. The one on the one, one on one end of it, one on the other. All right, we also, besides the baby boom, we have the business boom. Now, we had a very short recession when the war ended. Why? Because there was no other revenue coming in. They had to fix okay. it. Readjustment. What were we making during the war? Munitions. Yeah, thanks for the army. Munitions, tanks. Did we need to keep making that? No. Okay, so we have to retool the factories. Now, after we had that very short recession, then we come through a pretty long time boom. Now there's some ups and downs in there, but our, our downs are pretty short periods. But in 1946, when we had this recession, we had a whole lot of people panic thinking we're going right back in the Great Depression. And one of the things that was pushed through was the Employment Act in 1946. And, and basically the idea was let's keep people employed. And where I say what does this show, I kind of gave you the answer to that already, is that the fact that people were worried we might go back into a, a depression. Okay, I mean, that we, and it did, uh, really didn't need to because we had the factors that we had made really set us up to have a good, a good decade. One of the things that happened in this was a white collar job. What are white collar jobs? Businessmen, like, I mean, skilled. All right, businessmen, they're skilled, but they're skilled in like more professional manner. Like, a, uh, they're not technical ma matters here. Um, where a lot of times you hear blue collar, white collar, okay, blue collar a lot of times if you're a mechanic, if you're a welder, okay, you're skilled, but you're going to be using more of your hands. White collar could be an accountant, a lawyer, um, someone that can wear a white shirt and not worry about it getting dirty with their normal work. Yeah, if they go off to lunch and spill their lunch on it, they could, but that's what I agree with. Now, I have a question, how did the GI Bill contribute to growth of white collar jobs? Education. Yeah, all those soldiers that came back, we actually create more of that. 
And this is where we, when I introduced the, the GI Bill at the, the part for World War II, that you, you'll see its impact on a whole generation. Then we had this great business boom, but what about women? No women. They kind of went down. Well, not no women, but. They, kind of they went back to their household jobs. <laughs> And a lot of them that had worked during the world during the World War go back to the home, but not all of them. And this is where you have to also get it's not everything's not extremes. What about their pay though? It's not. Well, actually, No, they was the. What well, was their pay men. compared to men? Less. All right, it was less. There was no longer where FDR had an executive order. If you're working in a wartime industry that did not matter because of your gender or race, that no longer was in effect. So if you were a boss and you had Trace and you had Sarah, could you give them, even though they're just doing the same job, give them different salaries? Yeah. There's not, and so there wasn't anything that, that you could do uh, about this. So um, now, where a lot, where I kind of say a lot of the seeds of the feminist movement were made during the World War II. Okay, it would kind of simmer down a little bit from the 1950s, but then it's still brewing underneath there um, that you would have. So, so yes, there would still be women, not, not like what we've had been there. All right, I have a question. How did the savings and ration system during the war contribute to unprecedented pro prosperity in the 1950s? All right, during the war, even though you had money, could you go buy everything you wanted? No. Why not? For ration stands. Yeah, there was rations. Um, so, even though you got a hundred dollars in your pocket, you can't spend it all. $20. What would you sometimes do with that money? Save it. And what was a good investment that you could make and be patriotic? I'll say bonds. Maybe. Yeah, buy those bonds. Okay. Now they're in the 1950s. These bonds that you had saved from when you were working are now maturing, and then <coughs> you get the money back plus interest. And this would end up being some things that would really spur on the economy um, there. So it wasn't just where you had a spike. Um, and it did. It, it kind of forced Americans to save. Plus, a lot of Americans were saving anyways. There was a lot of people, when they got jobs during, the, during World War II, they were afraid that when the war is over, we're going back to the Great Depression. I'm going to set aside a little money, all right, just in case. And then after a couple of years and things are going pretty good, they realize, hey, we're not going back to this depression. So they were willing to spend, and they kind of just kept things going. All right, two type of businesses that you need to know. I know this is kind of just thrown in here, but here's a business aspect you have to know. Most famous for 1950. What is a franchise? Like McDonald's. It's, it is like a chain, and. <coughs> Matthew gave the example of McDonald's. It's the most famous of all of the franchises, which comes about in the 1950s. All right, we had the McDonald's brothers in California that had this hamburger joint, and Ray Kroc sees it and thinks, hey, this can make a lot of money, and he basically buys from the brothers. And what ends up happening with the franchise and for McDonald's is you know what you're going to get. All right, if you drove into Inverness here and we have... Um, Rustic Ranch, okay, nearby here. Rustic Ranch probably have a better hamburger than the McDonald's, all right, 300 yards away. But if you are a person that just drove into Inverness, are you sure about what Rustic Ranch is going to have? Do you know what you're getting at McDonald's? Mm -hmm. So if you're in the middle of Kansas, you're in the middle of New York, do you know what you're getting at McDonald's? Or Dylan, for your favorite place, you're not sure about these different boutiques, but do you know what you're getting at Claire's? Oh, true. Okay, when you need the right accessories, no, okay, you know, I mean, Claire's, I mean, I'm there. Um, but this is where, when you have it, and Subway is now one of the biggest ones, but you have the right. Now, if you have a franchise, you own a franchise, you have to do things their way. Okay, I mean, this is where, I mean, if, if you decide to open up a Five Guys here in Inverness, mm -hmm. all right, please don't because I will eat there way too often. Uh, but, it's, but this is where if you decide to open one up, all right, I believe, I'm not even sure, but I think it's something like 5% of your revenue automatically goes to Five Guys. You can't decide, hey, we're going to do, on, on a side, we're going to make our own little Philly steak sandwiches. Because Five Guys says no. All right, you're going to make basically these hamburgers, the hot dogs, and these french fries. That's their business model. 
If you're going to run their franchise, you do it their way. But you have that name on the tab. There are a whole lot of different franchises that, that you, I mean, you're all, you all are very familiar with that. It's beyond more than fast food, although that's where, yeah. All right, what is a conglomerate? Like something that you buy like, the rights uh, to? Procter & Gamble. Okay, Procter & Gamble is a conglomerate in here. All right, it's a business, but it's a business that makes all kinds of different things. Like Darren and how they make like the Walmart. Like the Olive Garden and the and lobster. And that would be actually, it is a conglomerate even though they're focusing on restaurants. The biggest conglomerate in the world is GE. All right, General Electric. Most of you know General Electric, you think of electric products like refrigerators and washing machines. GE is the largest um, or the second largest, I'm not sure if it's the largest or second largest right now, manufacturer of aircraft engines in the world. Um, until just recently, they were also one of the biggest um, firms when it came to media. Uh, they are selling out that market, but if you watch NBC, all the NBC channels and all are owned by GE. They're also, a quarter of their business comes from banking. All right, I mean, it's a giant conglomerate um, that you have. Um, yeah, you see all these different things here. These different channels are ones that GE owns. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because because GE was the biggest media market. They're getting out of the media market now. Um, they're they're focusing on they're in, on other interests. But said so this is where you have a lot of it. But you might and again like you might mint, you might go towards one sector of the market and, and work on. it. And there, but Procter and Gamble is an example. They have all these different products. Kraft Foods, even though they focus on food, so you'll have that. PepsiCo, okay? They they make they make a lot of different things that, that you have. So, but that's the conglomerate, and this is where we will see both franchises and conglomerates grow in the 1950s um, and continue today. All right, labors and and labor and unions. After the war, we have a lot of inflation. Okay. During the war, we would not have inflation because the government said you cannot raise prices too much. You cannot raise wages. Okay. The government coming in during the war and controlling things. Once the war is over, though, we have to have a little bit of time before the free market catches up. Okay, and then we get kind of get supply and demand and coming around. Um, but right afterwards, there was a lot of panic that okay, the price of everything is going up. Well, a lot of workers thought they, that they should get paid more then. And where we ended up having what could have been a really a tragedy in some ways, a lot of workers and coal mines decided they were going to go on strike in the middle of winter. Now, it doesn't matter much to us here if a bunch of coal miners go on strike. Actually, it does, since a lot of our power is by coal right now. But if you lived up north, would you have needed the coal to keep your house warm during the winter? Mm -hmm. So you'd have that furnace that you're putting in. So, and that's why they're going to go on strike. People need it, so they have. And Truman had to come in for the government, and he threatened action. Sorry. The way that he threatened the action was, you go on strike, if, I, if you're on strike, I'm putting you in the army. Oh, man. All right, basic, basically, you're drafted. Um, and that is where he's at. Now, Truman is a Democrat. Democrats are usually friendly with labor, but this is where Truman was. Truman didn't mince words. Okay? He had he had his slogan was the buck stops here. Okay, he was supported labor unions, but he's like, no, you don't hold the nation hostage. Okay, you don't in the middle of winter decide to go on strike. Okay, there are certain things that that you do. So um, even though he's friendly to labor, he's not going to go and bend over backwards um, when it comes to that. All right, here is, put stars, arrows, everything to this, the Taft-Hartley Act. It was passed in 1947, goes mainly into effect in 1948. That is one of the reasons why, under bracketing dates, I, I had that on there for 48 to kind of combine it with that election. The first thing that it did was it outlawed the closed shop. A closed shop means if you work for a business that you have to join a union. Well. It then said it said that then states could make it where they are right to work states. Florida is an example of a right to work state. If you see this map, I know it's kind of hard for you to see with this, but the ones that are in this teal color are right to work states. Okay? They are not allowed to have closed shops. So if you open a business here in Florida, 
You cannot have it where a union forces your workers to join that union. Um, well, there's some of the reason that they'd have it is they're already fighting for things. Like I, me as a teacher, if I'm not a member of the union, I still get the benefits where they negotiate the, the wages. So why should it be that the people that are going to get the raises don't contribute to the people that negotiate? That's the idea of having a closed shop is. If, uh, there, if, if you're in the union, Taylor's not, Devin's not, but you and Austin are, you're paying dues and they fight for safety things and fight for more vacation, should they get the benefit while you're paying the dues? So that's why unions will say, if we're fighting for things, um, that you have it. Um, the political side of the Taft-Hartley, and the reason why they did this, is they knew that it would weaken unions. It didn't happen immediately. Unions actually, the top years we'd have for union, union percentage of, of America would be right around 1950-51. But after that, unions would go down. Um, around 1950, it was approximately 30% of workers in America were union members. Now it's down to less than 13, I believe. So the effects of Taft partly would take a long time in here. Some other facts that they had here. The president could declare a 80-day cooling off period. We kind of learned from that that the coal mine strikes and some of the other strikes all right, well, let's have a time period that, okay, before you actually go on strike, we're going, you're going to cool off, we're going to talk over things over before you can actually go and do something like that. The president could intervene. Even though Truman was one that was going to do that, he vetoed this bill, but it was, uh, it was overridden. Okay, two-thirds of Congress uh, when it um, overrode. Um, another thing with labor, and this is where I always tell you when you see labor unions, what's the biggest labor union you should remember? Yeah. AFL. Okay, 1955, the AFL and the CIO would reunify. They had split up. The CIO includes a lot of people that are not skilled workers. So they had, where they had split up before, they joined back together. Now for recent history, you know what's happening right now in history with the AFL and the CIO. They're splitting back up. Okay, but whenever it comes to history, if you ever see something when in doubt, if there's something, I mean, if you know for sure when they're asking a question and you know, oh, Terrence Powderly, I know that's the Knights of Labor. But if you're not sure, the one labor union that's been around the longest and the most powerful is the AFL uh, that you have. So, but they, they do unify back together in there. Uh, I said this is that the peak would be in the 1950s, there, and then they would lessen their effect. Here's where I have a question, and this is not something that has a short term. The right to work laws, so these states in blue, how would that help the South? People in the factory unions would come here? Yeah, if you own a factory and you're planning to build a new factory, you going to build it in states where they could force your workers to be in unions? Or are you going to put it where you don't have the unions that you have to deal with? What city is most famous for building automobiles? Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, Detroit. Okay, and most of the automobiles used to be built in here. Ford, GM, Chrysler. Where are most new car factories built today? China. South. When Ford built their giant factory for making their top selling car, the Taurus? Atlanta. F-150s? San Antonio. Okay, other companies that come in. Uh, the Toyota Camry, I believe, is built in Kentucky or Tennessee. Okay, BMW, when they built, when they brought a plant to the United States to build the BMWs, it's in South Carolina. Okay, so this is where, and we're going to see where we have this shift from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt. Air conditioning would contribute, but here's where those jobs also would move um, in here, which we will see. And if you for Detroit and the uh, impact. So then, why wouldn't the North? Northern states like make them make them right to work states. And you're actually this this last election, the state of Indiana, I believe it was Indiana. Um, Indiana actually went and the governor signed a bill and they went from being a <coughs> being a closed shop to an open shop state. Uh, Michigan actually is negotiating that right now, and Michigan may become a right to work state which is the, the most famous state probably that there ever is for unions, might now change because they realize they've lost so many jobs that way. And politically, they need to change. All right, Rust Belt, Sun Belt. This is not just the 1950s. This is actually even today that this trend that we would have. 
Not one thing would do it. Taft-Hartley would contribute to this. Part of this would be during World War II. A lot of people trained in California. A lot of people trained in Florida. I mean, if you're trained in the military, can you, can you, do you have better weather in Florida to train in than you have in Michigan? If you grew up in Michigan and you're in Florida in January, February, and March, and you're training here, and then you go out and fight a war, you come back, and then you're sitting in a nice cold weather, and you have week after week of sitting in a whole bunch of snow, do you remember fondly those days that you were in Florida, and when you were in February, all right, it wasn't that cold. You didn't have to shovel snow when you were at Camp Landing outside of real close to where Gainesville was. So a lot of people kind of looked at that um, in there. We also built a lot of different of our new industries. We built them in the South. And one thing the Cold War you're going to see is we don't build the big factories. We build a lot of smaller ones. Um, when we kind of look at the Cold War, what this happens is the fact that in case there was a nuclear strike, you don't want all of your industries in one place. So you build parts of it all over so there's no one city you take out. So even if you're going to build something, you build part of it here, part of it there, part of it in other places. You say, well, there were the least amount of factories in the south and the west, so you build them there for the new ones. And then air conditioning. One bad thing we have here in Florida, besides hurricanes. <coughs> as nice as it is this time of the year, as you go outside, and here we are in February, and the Midwest is getting ready to have get pounded today by snow. And you all are going to go outside. And yeah, it was a little chilly this morning, but it's going to be about 80 degrees this afternoon. Okay, I mean, this is where you kind of hit. But what is it like in August? Oh, terrible. Sweaty. All right, yeah. I mean, you just, you walk outside and just sweat the heat and humidity. Air conditioning nice? Okay, so this is what as our air conditioners kicked on here, as if you were up north, all right, we would have the heater go. All right, Rust Belt, where the old industries were and where people are living in the Sun Belt. And we're gonna see this transformation, it's still occurring. If you look on the Electoral College map over there, you will see some of them have pluses on it and some are minus. That is where, for the, for the House of Representatives, the number of House seats that they have. New York minus two, Pennsylvania minus one, uh, New Jersey minus one, Ohio minus two, Michigan minus one, Iowa minus one, South Carolina plus one, Georgia plus one, Florida plus two, Texas plus four, Arizona plus one. Okay. Now, Louisiana is the one thing that breaks it up. What happened between 2000 and 2010 should make, make Louisiana lose population? Yeah, Katrina. So people moved out of there. But for the most part, most things you have people moving from the north to the south how many of you have parents or grandparents that grew up in the rust belt okay over half of you in here you're an example of the shift from the rust belt to the sun belt uh, i will tell you that and i was an area on the coast growing up i still remember my seventh grade class that i had um, down in jensen beach florida and the teacher had asked, well, how many of you were born in New York? How many of you were born in New, New Jersey? And raising hands. How many of you were born in Florida? And there were three of us in an entire class that were born in Florida. Okay? There were more people in my seventh grade class that had been born in New York, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and New Jersey than there had been born in Florida um, there. Because that, we have a lot of people that have been here longer than a lot of places. Um, you compare Inverness to Newport Ritchie, okay, I mean, and, and they have a lot more people that have moved, moved in. Um, all right, here we get to the suburbs. This is what a lot of people know of and think of in the 1950s. Um, single generation majority of middle class Americans would become suburbanites. Now, what is the suburbs? Right outside the city. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a out, it's outside the cities. It's not the rural area, but you would have. They could be cities. A lot of them, kind of today, you would think of it as a city. I remember that. Now, why do we have this? 
here's where again, it's not any one thing. That's how this is these make for great things to be able to write where you have to connect things together. How did the GI Bill help people to move out of the city and into the suburbs? With what? Businesses. Well, not. Remember, one of the things was a loan. Well, the education, more money. But they could get loans. So if you're building these new houses, did we build a whole lot of houses between 1929 and 1945? No. Okay, so there aren't a whole lot of new houses being built at the time. Is there a time to catch up? Now people have money for a lot of these soldiers that they can get a low interest loan. What's the effect of the baby booms? Yeah, Ben's got his three kids now. Okay, happy Jessica. He is happy to have that. All right. He doesn't want to live in the city. He wants to go and have it. As, it, as you had heard twice there with the general talking about at the end of the day, he wants to go home, he wants to have his beer, he wants to watch his football game. Okay? <laughs> Part of the American dream. Okay? You just, um, that, that's that. The effects of the Depression and World War II savings. Again, like I kind of said, we didn't build a whole lot of house, but how about the savings? Again, that whole thing where you weren't spending money, you might have liberty bonds coming, you now suddenly have $2,000 that's becoming mature in 1952 that you had bought in liberty bonds. Okay, um, what was the price they said for the 7000 Yeah, 7000 which today would be around $70,000 in today's money. Which, realistically, $70,000 for today here in Inverness, you go up to the Highlands, you're talking about a not a big house, but a three bedroom, two bath, might have a one car garage, might have a carport on it, uh, medium sized yard, middle class home. Okay, and so that's where, for a lot of people when he had lived, okay, Ben might have lived in New York City and he lived in a little row house or actually something almost like the tenant, tenement houses, except for they would have plumbing a little bit more. But now you're able to go and get there. We haven't, that, haven't had the part of note yet for the Interstate Highway Act, but you saw yesterday for a video. Now suddenly we have job, have things. Ben can live in the suburb, but work in the city. And we have these roads connecting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Early in the Great Depression, FDR, when after FDR was elected, we would live uh, in that. Yeah. All right, Levitt Towns. All right. This, this is not the only suburb. But it is one that you kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it was the, the biggest ones. Again, there was one, one in Pennsylvania, one in New Jersey, one outside of New York City, Long Island area. If, and some of you, actually, if you go to some of the old homes in the front of Silver Spring, or Silver Springs, uh, Citrus Springs, um, some of the old Beverly Hill homes that you have, you might have it where you have like four or five homes in a row that are all built that are identical. Uh, we had Deltona Corporation that was, that was kind of like how, how uh, Levitt Towns works, except for they came a little bit later. If you went to your neighbor's house, you didn't have to ask where the bathroom was because it was in the exact same place that your house was. Um, and, there, and it was one of those, that, uh, I believe that in one thing, and we have actually here's for Levitt Towns. Pretty much it was the same model. I know with one of the ones you had a choice, three different choices. For a little extra money, you could have a one car garage or you would have a one car carport, or you could have like a little back porch that was built on. But for the main part of the house, it was all the same um, that you had. Now, here's what I want you to think. 1950s, one thing a lot of people think of is conformity. Even with their housing projects, projects are they pretty much conformist? Yeah. All right. And that's why when you saw that video, now, when they were talking about building the home, and they were saying about dropping off the wood, plumbing late at this time. It wasn't like they did all that in one day, but what you had is crews that would go and you would work here and you basically moved on the line and it was like an assembly line building these houses uh, that you had. Okay, white flight. When you think of suburbs, white flight. As Ben moves out of the city, he moves to the suburb. He's still working the city. He's taking the, taking the interstate into the city. But he and his happy wife, all right, she's home with three kids. Now, are we up to four now, Ben? 
<laughs> um, but, but this is where a lot of our white families moved out of the city. What ended up happening, though, is people that could not afford to move to the suburbs for what was left. A lot of times, this would be ethnic groups. Now, we would not see this effect immediately, but we also have the taxpayers. Then, as a working person, play, pays more money. The people that are educated are more moving out. So your poorer people, whether they be white, black, any ethnic group, because remember we have a lot of these European groups that are still still in different groups there. And what would end up happening is their tax base would, leave, would get mine. And we're going to find in the 1960s then the decay of the inner city and the 70s. Now, anyone know what the trend is today for when it comes to cities? New Richard. Well, those are more people are going there. Yeah, people are moving back in because a lot of people are real lot go and it not. And for one thing, do people have as many kids today? No. No. And a lot of people decide, professionals, I don't want to have any kids. So why I move out in the suburbs where we have like Lakewood Ranch? You make this little false little place um, and, make, and make everything look look that way. Why not just move to the city where everything is real? You live in Atlanta. Let's move back to Buckhorn. Okay, Buckhorn's a nice neighborhood there. It's right in downtown. A friend of mine, I mean, he lives he lives in Buckhorn. All right, he can he can walk to the grocery store. Okay, I mean, there's from his house. I mean, within a mile, I know some of you walk a mile, but walk a mile. I mean, he can go to all these different restaurants. That it I'm not talking about there. So. All right, here's a chart. Look at this chart. It's and this is one kind of C. Our changes. 1920 is the first time that we would end up having more people living urban than, than in the rural areas. But you see here, then the cities go down. The rural areas kind of end up going down. But for suburbs, we keep moving up. And again, that trend kind of continues on until the last couple of decades here. All right. Well, I don't have anything for y'all tomorrow. How are we getting to the suburbs? Yeah, cars. And when you think of the 1950s, this is when America falls in love with the automobile. Um, and I have on here several different things. Uh, now, first of all, we will have the Eisenhower Interstate, or what would be the, the Highway Act that would be passed on. <coughs> first of all, do any of y'all know how you number interstates? North, south, east, west. Okay, the north and south one would be odd numbers, and then east to west are even. And then is there any structure with the numbering? The top, the north yeah, is higher. Like like and basically, when you, if you start zero to this direction, okay, this is why you go five, and then you basically start from the bottom up from zero when you go to numbering there. That's why Interstate 5 is in California, 95 goes up the east coast. Um, here in Florida, we have 75, which you say, well, 95 and 75 are real close to each other, but 75 goes to Michigan. So this is where you kind of look up in here and see where they are. Here's 10, 20, 40, um, 70, 80, 90, and there's not as much on the higher part, but that's where you kind of have a, have a spaced out that direction. Okay. Why do we have I-4? Okay, now I-4, I-10's above here, I-4 is here. And what is up? It's going. It's going east to west. Even though it slants from Daytona, basically takes kind of a south, southeast, a southwest or southwest northeast slant. But it, the overall direction was to connect Florida and, the, and basically 95, 75 together. Um, why did we make the interstate system? Military. Yeah, it's military. Yeah. Eisenhower had been general in Europe. Did Germany have a road system that assisted their military greatly? Autobahn. Yeah, the Autobahn. And the Autobahn was not made to go fast. It was made to move military back and forth and supplies quickly. Um, and Eisenhower saw that. Now, when we were watching the one video, and they were talking about the shield signs, where like Highway 41 is 200 yards in that direction, and that has the white shield. You could take Highway 41 and I think go all the way to Atlanta on it. How long is it going to take you to get there on Highway 41 going to Atlanta? 
Six hours on Highway 41? Four hours. Four hours? Probably what? Eight. Eight hours. To Atlanta. Eight. 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 Okay, on Highway 41. Think of the stoplights you have here. You get, we don't have many from here to Dunellen, but then you get some in Dunellen. Then you get to go through Williston. And then you get to go through little town after little town. You might have a tractor in front of you. Or you go a little bit away from here, you jump on I Interstate 75. Then, where you all are saying, in four hours, you're really, you're not going to make it in four hours. Okay. Well, I drive I mean, Abbey, so, I mean, maybe. You're, you're going to get caught somewhere in there. South Georgia, they're waiting for you. So, if you're, if you're going to make it in four hours, you're going to be going well over 150 miles per hour. They're going to they're catch you there. Um, and, um, so, so you might be able to get, and if you're really booking, six hours might be pushing it uh, for the south part of Metro Atlanta. But eight hours would be a good estimate that you go. But Highway 41, you leave now, well, some of that in Georgia then during the night won't be as bad of traffic when you're going through these little towns in the middle of the night. But otherwise, it's going to take them twice as long. Um, and it made for convenience. And the idea of the interstate is that you don't have stoplights. You try to make things where you can move fast. Uh, now, they purposely made straightaways. Okay, straightaways is not where you go fast. Why is it that one out of every five miles is straight? Yeah, for landing of planes. We, ought, we automatically have, between here and Tampa, we have runways that are built in case McDill Air Force Base is bombed. We don't have to go and completely build it. They can come in and have some temporary runways made um, there. If it, as long as it's possible to be done, they're supposed to build one mile that are areas that are straight um, there. So they are to make sure with the interstates that um, unless it can't be done, like in the mountains or something like that, you are not allowed to have more than the such and such percent grade. Okay, so so you kind of round up. And even in the mountains, they try to make sure it's not anything that great um, that you have, so that tr so that things can move at a, a fast pace. Uh, what is meant by death by interstate? Yeah, the interstate was great as long as the exit went to your town. When I seventy five was built, was that good for Inverness? Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't. If you would have owned a hotel here in Inverness 40 years ago, how did you like the idea that I-75, I mean, it's only 20 minutes, 20 miles away. How many new hotels do we have in Inverness that, that have been built in the past 40 years? A yeah, lot. The one that was just built on the other side of Walmart over there. But you think in the other part of it, I don't think we've had any that have built. So all the hotels, those old hotels and motels that were built, were back with Highway 41, and people took it. If they were going to Tampa, all right, they drove through Inverness. They stopped. Um, a lot of you been to Silver Springs. There used to be in Dunellen, Rainbow Springs, that was a bigger attraction than Silver Springs was. They used to have glass bottom boats in, at Rainbow Springs. I mean, now it's a state park, but that was the attraction was there. But when I-75 came, were people going to be going through Dunellen? And so that's where Dunellen kind of had some of that death by interstate. So that's why Rainbow Springs, if you go to the state park, you'll get, see they used to have, I mean, there's some of the cages still there from where they used to have some of the birds and the animals at. They have a little bit of pillar they had it wasn't a monorail system like what you have at Disney, but they actually had this monorail. It's almost like a tram that went around on a rail around Rainbow Springs um, there. So that, but they had, but again, this is where you'd have the, the death by interstate in that way. Um, it did not kill Dunellen and Inverness, but for several decades, there wasn't a whole lot of growth. Um, all right, how did the interstates help to expand the suburbs? Yeah. Ben, Ben's able to get to his job, all right, in the city, because it's connected together. Now, we expanded our automobile industry, and this is where we would go from what was the biggest industry in the early 1900s, by then the mid-1900s, automobile industry would surpass 
the railroads. Not only are people driving, but what else happens to make it where we make the railroads not as important? We can big trucks. Yeah, we became where we could move trucks around. Not only do you, can you go and move things around, but you can move it even closer to where you really want it. And there was no reason to worry about it. Gas was cheap. We in the United States, we, we were exporting gas still. And no problem, because there's other countries that, in the rest of the world that we can buy it from cheap. Why don't we just do that now? <laughs> well, here's where, where supply and demand. Other places also got it. But and we actually were going to, in the next few years, we're actually in North America, uh, pretty much become independent economically when it comes to, to gas. Something that 10 years ago we would have never thought um, in there. But between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, okay, we probably truly get it where we don't have to buy oil from other countries uh, there. I mean, our technology has made it where we've discovered some of it on there. But railroads, why do we have the rails to trails here in Inverness? Yeah, what happened to the Juju train that used to come through here? Yeah, there was a, if you were a railroad company, was there as much of a reason to have that track? Where's the only place that a railroad goes through Citrus County? Well, if it goes through Donnellan, where's it go to from Donnellan? That ends at the power plant. And basically what we have is every two or three days a train loaded up with coal goes to the power plant, dumps off the coal, and goes back and forth from Kentucky or West Virginia, uh, traveling with back and forth with the coal for our coal plants. Yeah. Okay, and that's actually in Sumter County, though. But yeah, that's where, and that's the reason why for here in Inverness, they have, um, and I'm not sure how many lines went through Inverness. I know at Dunellen at one time, Dunellen used to have four different tracks coming to that little town. Okay, now they just have the one that goes to the Chris River Power Plant. Uh, now, there's some people looking and saying maybe we should expand railroad again. You hear commercials for our railroads, now that fuel is more expensive. Can one locomotive haul a lot of weight? Uh, but we got rid of a lot of those tracks that we used to have. All right, here's a question, and this is what, notice how I'm that we're here for the automobiles, okay? Yes, there are SFIs that kind of remember when things, the interstate system, but notice here's the, the broad idea that, that you have, and what the impact it had on others that change over time. What do I mean by creating a more homogeneous view of the United States? Well, it didn't come that, but Americans, we always, I mean, we have certain things that we are Americans, but were we more regional? 1950. Was there a little bit of a difference between a person growing up in Florida and a person growing up in Illinois? How would automobiles change a lot of that? And you spread it and spread it quicker. Even when it came down to our food, what was the most famous franchise? Okay. When, the, when the franchises get bigger? 1950s. Because when people are moving around, do they want something more familiar? Okay, so you had that. So it actually it, it comes and create creates that. And we remember one of the things we have for the nineteen fifties is conformity. Does that help us to become more conformist? All right, other effects that I have on here, vacations. Americans got a lot more money. You got a car. Can you go to vacation wherever you want? Get in the car, our family. Businesses are actually giving people more vacation time, paid vacations. Any effect on Florida that way? Anybody from up north that wants to come to Florida during the winter for vacation? Yeah. College students maybe wanted to come down here during spring break. Or uh, I mean, and do you think that would make an impact in the 1950s when? 
when these families were coming down and vacationing and some of them would later on say, you know, when I stopped working, I'd rather live in Florida than in Ohio. And in this area, Beverly Hills, Citrus Springs, those areas, they, they got people here, buy these lots. And you buy it right now real cheap, and then 20 years from now, you can build your house on it, build your retirement home. And that's what a lot of people ended up doing. So they bought it a long time. Uh, what's a motel compared to a hotel? Motel's like two stars. Yeah, you have an outside room, basically the outside doors. Okay, a hotel, you have the inside hallways with the doors. The motels, you drive right up. Okay, if you are, I mean, if you, and that's where we're becoming a, we were becoming a car culture. I right, want to be able to get in and out of your car. Now today, why don't people like motels as much as a hotel? They're dirty. Hookers? Not as nice. <laughs> well, there's roaches in the bathtub. Okay, that's the thing now. Uh, we're more worried about security. Oh, really? Okay, are you able to be more secure? <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you where you were saying about dirty and not as nice, well, we're not building motels as much, so usually your motels are older. I mean, here in, here in Inverness, there's the, there's the one that's, what, I mean, not too far from here, and it's probably 50 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's five people, yeah. That one's nice. Uh, but yeah. Um, Consumerism. None of you care anything at all about what type of car anybody has or what type of car you want to get, right? All right? It doesn't matter. Well, some of you it doesn't matter. Right? You just want to have something. All right, but it doesn't matter, right? As long as it has wheels and gets you where you're going. Oh yeah. And so, sir. Um, by the way, here's a picture of the world's most famous beach. Okay. Well, they have people come to Daytona Beach and park on it. I mean, um, it's, it's funny to kind of see some of the old photographs and same place where if you go to Daytona right now and you see the exact same place um, there on, on the, on, well, you can't park on the strip park now, but on the other side of the strip. All right, I have on here the quote, youth culture. And here's where the 1920s comes in, but the 1950s really makes it this way. We become really a youth culture in the 1950s, and the idea of trends that were started. Automobile have anything to do with that? Okay, and some of them, I mean, this, there are. Uh, now, the key thing is, now the automobiles, and this is actually about the next part of this, uh, and here, where we have a lot of things with the automobiles, they didn't last real long, but people didn't care. A lot of people would buy a car in your family car, you'd buy a new car every year, every two years. Really? Wow. Uh, this is where, I mean, I know for a lot of people, my grandfather's generation, that were they were basically, they were the working ages in the 50s, that was kind of the idea that you did. I mean, you'd have it for a year. I mean, you only have one car in the family, but you bought a new car and traded it in. Put 15, 20,000 miles on a car, get a new one. Or, You'd have it only for three or four years. Uh, some of you, if you looked at the odometer of your car, it might have quite a few miles on it. In the 1950s, it would. I know, I know on my moped, I got 170,000 miles on my moped. Where are you going? Well, you think about it. Me driving here back and forth the Crystal River every day. Do I put some mileage on it? Wait, yeah. Um, you drive your moped to work? Yes, I drive my moped. No. I thought you put it in like college. Yeah. You still I didn't do that. Do you still drive that? Yes, I do. My daughter rides on the back. I mean, it's, <laughs> oh, it's cold for on some of those mornings. Oh my God. Yeah. Just hang on. That is a Is that one of those side things? Oh no, she's coming. But. She falls off, drives a little bit, bounces up, and gets <laughs> Now, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, someone actually saw someone ride a moped. Ah, that's Mr. Bass on his moped. And there, they really thought it was me, but Mr. Bass, what's your moped name? Susie. Told you. Red, white, and blue. Yeah, Sasha. Sasha's is all in those. Yeah, it's for us. He could have a sidecar with his daughter. I don't know. But his wasn't red, white, and blue. 
<laughs> Mr. Baz, you have to stop doing that. Sarah and Taylor definitely thought you'd be a sister at the moped thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, gas prices. Oh, the vehicle that I drive that does not get near the gas mileage that a moped would have because it's probably the biggest one in the teacher's apartment out there. And it's not. Do you actually have one or not? No, he yeah. doesn't have a moped. Of course I have one. Wait, did you have one? No. Oh. Gator. That's what the university of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're the ones with the mopeds, and then they have their football players stealing the moped on there. That's what that, the one lineman that got arrested last week at the University of Florida for stealing a moped on there. So he didn't know, well, he bought a stolen. He didn't know it was stolen. He just thought it was a great buy when he was buying it from. So, but don't worry, okay, Hunter Johnson, he gets all the Gators off. Um, there, so it's a uh, pair four yesterday. They dropped the charges for his marijuana there for, for Florida. So Hunter Hunter Johnson, all right, you Gator fans, he's the greatest Gator that there is because he's a, he's a lawyer in Gainesville, and, he, and when you see it, when they get whenever the Gators get arrested for their football and basketball players, he's the one that gets the business, and business is good in Gainesville. <laughs> so it's um, Urban Meyer was really good. Okay, that has picked up here in the last couple of, last couple of months. All right, so let's say it. All right, now I went to Florida State. We don't even have mopeds at Florida State because it was such a small campus. It's a city school. All right, University of Florida. I mean, you got cow pastures in the middle of the University of Florida, so you have to ride a moped around. Florida State. I could literally do a jog from one end of the campus to the other in about 15 minutes um, there, but it's all compact in there. But you can't park on campus. Okay, I mean, that's the only, basically only the professors. You park at the stadium and take the buses into campus. Um, all right, but going back to the 1950s, um, have on here between 45 and 60, our disposable income triple. What was that statistic they said for the Americans compared to Europe? What was, that, what was our... 10 times or no well, it started out when the war ended, it was four to five times. And then by the time we get to the early 50s, we were 15 times richer than the average European. Okay, I mean, this is where for America we were. All right, we were the highest in the world, but not only were we the highest in the world, I mean, we are way higher than everyone else at that time. 80% um, of the cars made in the world were made in the United States and bought in the United States. I mean, it's, we were that much there. Um, I say it would help add to a consumer culture, and we have all these things going on. Now, planned obsolescence. If your refrigerator was to break, your family goes out and buys a new refrigerator, okay? Let's say average price is about $1,000. Okay, you might be able to get some cheaper. It might be six, $700 for a new one. Um, you might pay two or $3,000, but for most people, normal family, you're gonna be paying eight, nine, Hundred thousand dollars. How long do you expect that refrigerator to last? Fifteen years. Twenty years. Two years. Two years. Two years. Two years. Fifteen years. Are you saying years. now or back then? Now. Okay. Now. My mom got a used. Fifteen years. My mom, whenever my parents got married, they bought a used freezer, and we and they've been married for like twenty years. And when they bought it, it they didn't know how old it was, but it was like twenty or thirty years old when they bought it. So it was like. Like we just got rid of it. I mean, it was like from like the sixties. Okay. <laughs> now, in the fifties, though, when in the late forties, when it, a lot of things they had, it was planned obsolescence. The idea there, if you bought a refrigerator, you it was only going to last you a couple of years, and you're going to get a new one every two, three years. Uh, cars, again, a car that made it to fifty thousand miles before the engine blew was rare. For those of you that like working on cars. Okay, for a high schooler, it was great if you were willing to work on a car because you could, if you could rebuild an engine, all right, no problem. Okay, there's all kinds of cars that were pretty cheap that had 50, 60,000 miles on it. You know, the engine's going to blow pretty soon, but hey, if you can rebuild the engine, put a put a new engine in there, rebuild, I mean, rebuild it, put it in, and go. All right, a car that got to 100,000 miles, yeah, that that's that's just like fantasy. Okay, as most of you, that probably the cars that you do have are probably. 100,000 miles or more for a lot of you in it. So, but that's where it was kind of seen that idea. So it's kind of wasteful, right? You're just, again, it's a throwaway society. Is that why we How long so do you expect jobs? your cell phone to last? Are you 
Alright, and this is where you have to see the difference. Planned obsolescence in the 1950s was with washing machines, refrigerators, cars. You didn't plan. If your cell phone broke, are you going to go and pay to get it fixed? No. Or you'll get a new no, one. Oh, you're talking about now. 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 I'll get a new one. And yeah, you basically, and that was the idea in the 1950s. Your refrigerator broke, yeah, you didn't call a repair person, you just got a new one. Car, all right, and just, again, that was the idea because the technology was getting so much better every single year. All right, and it's a, what you all think with phones, computers, okay, I mean, it's, if, if you have a three-year-old computer, Actually, if you buy a brand new computer, brand new HP or Dell, it's already outdated by the time they yeah. can mass produce it. Okay, so and that's kind of the way the cars work. Mm -hmm. If you bought a 1955 model car at the end of 1954, they've already got the technology that the 1956s are going to be better. So, well, what are they doing with all these cars with refrigerators and everything? Well, and this is where a lot of our junk, the recycling wasn't thought of. And that's where we've had to change the culture during my lifetime, is to kind of see the difference of not being a throwaway culture for things. Okay, and that's, um, and this, and first, I mean, for some of your grandparents, that's why for some of them, well, they, they don't think about, all right, recycling, where you all have grown up no, thinking, grown okay, up. you throw it. Yeah, all right, I mean, so it wasn't. And that's the reason why we have a lot less jobs now, because like our cars last a lot longer, so we don't need to make and as some, cars. And this is where technology has. I mean, it's, um, and I, I, when I was teaching economics last, last semester, I remember seeing the statistic that we had for what the average age of a car is now compared to what it was in the 80s. And it's something like six or seven years older for the average age of a car now than just, I mean, I can't, I'm not talking about the 1950s. Okay, cars are a lot, are a lot older. I mean, that's, um, 20 year, year old cars were, are, are antiques. But are there a lot of cars now that are 20 years or getting close to 20 years? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, that's not as rare as it used to be. Uh, a lot of new products that came around. Um, I have on here the ad advertising age, the, the effects of TV. And we haven't got to the TV part, but where TV gets big in the 1950s, you see those come together. All right, here's some commercials. I'll take a little bit different mindset in the 1950s than today for some of these commercials. For a better start in life, start cola earlier. So encourage your children to drink Coca Cola. Get to be healthy babies. Uh huh. Or you never. The only thing is, here's where the difference. What what was the size for for the the bottle Coke back in the 1950s? Yeah, it was those little eight ounces. Okay, it's small. Actually, I got some back in there. That's not for that size. All right, with the coat. All right, isn't it? Um, today, how many of those would it take to fill up your big gulp? Quite a few. Twenty. Actually, four of them. And so, and for for things that we have today, so. And, what, and that's where we now, I mean, we have so much of that. All right. Do you think you have a commercial if, you ever, if your husband finds out, all right, you're not store testing a fresher coffee, but do you think that commercial would, would get by today where your husband's spanking his wife? Oh, my God. <laughs> all right. <laughs> more camel, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarettes. Oh, my God. I saw this one. Is this from the 1950s where it says, uh, Give your kids butter to lubricate their pants. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's work. <laughs> so, uh, to lubricate their veins? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> 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 Alright, now we'll get to television. <laughs> Remember how radio was from the 1920s? Television is from the 1950s. The beginning of the 20s? Some people have radios by the end. Pretty much most families have a radio. Same thing's true for for the television in the 1950s. Um, in the beginning of the 1950s, some have it, but by the end, most middle class families would have a television um, there. Now, a lot of different shows, and this is where these are. If you're ever writing about things, I mean, try to remember some of the names of the, these shows. Um, I Love Lucy, Father Knows Best, Van Sant, Ozzy and Har Harriet. Actually, Ozzy and Harriet is something that I don't think I've ever seen the show, but if you ever hear someone talking about Ozzy and Harriet, okay, it's that's an Ozzy and Harriet family, 
What does that mean? Crazy. Not crazy. No. Perfect. Uh, traditional. Basically, it's a husband, wife doing it, and basically they're the traditional ones. Uh, here's Ozzie and Harriet. Here's the husband, here's the wife, all right, and they have their two sons. All right, husband goes off, goes and works his job, while wife stays home, takes care of the kids. Uh, the one that most of y'all know is Leave It to Beaver. Okay, um, and there, if you've ever seen with that, we have Beaver, Cle Cleaver here, War goes off, Miss Cleaver is at home, working in there in the suburbs, and then we have Wally and Beaver, and the children. What? Where's those two sons? Well, and here's where you look at things. All right, were, was there maybe an orientation towards males? Okay, yeah. All right, now, one thing you kind of look at this, I mean, even the father knows best, which, where is that one at? Oh, right. oh here it is right here. All right, there's some daughters here. Okay, it's straight. Um, that. But even when you have this, you notice that the high different society. Um, what's the race of all the people that are up there except for one of them? White. white. Yeah, the white. And the one that isn't white is Hispanic, but white, which where we have I Love Lucy. And they kind of was some of the difference. And this is where you kind of look at some things a little bit later on and see how did I Love Lucy change a little bit of the stereotypes. All right, a person that was Cuban um, there. And this is where, where you see him. And Desi Arnaz, who was a star uh, with Lucille Ball. All right, there were three national networks. ABC, NBC, CBS. I mean, NBC now has 20 channels of their own. Uh, we started getting a little bit later on, and this would be actually be in the 60s, when we started getting some public broadcast networks. So you might, but for the most part, yeah. Um, the FCC, the Federal Communications Chairman, um, this is a quote a lot of times used where you're talking about television was just going to make it where it's a vast wasteland how our children were going to be. Later on, they would look at things and say the TV for itself for violence. Okay, but this is where you kind of look at. All right, how is culture, culture portrayed on TV? Perfect. Family. Traditional, and it is almost like a perfect family. Um, was that actually the way everybody was living at that time? Dad goes to work, mom stays home in the suburbs, kids are there. Now, were there families like that in the suburbs? Yes. Yes. But were there single mothers, divorced families, families that were mixed? But this is where you kind of, kind of look at what they saw on TV um, in here. Um, what's the role of the father seen in the 1950s? Okay, it's breadwinner. Father knows best. This is where we actually can kind of look at things, and one thing that's kind of been written about is how's the father portrayed in so many television shows today? Right. What? Yeah, the idiots. All right. It's, I mean, who? I mean, you're not going to make it where. I mean, it's basically the person that. I mean, whether you're thinking of Simpsons for Homer Simpson, or I mean, even, um, even when you have television shows, a lot of times it's kind of seen as a do nothing that All right, once again, homogeneous culture. How does television make America more of just basically one culture? Yeah, you look at the TV, and this is what you're kind of seeing. All right, what if you are different? All right, you kind of, kind of look at it. The other thing that comes in, and this is where we make a big difference for accents. If you're from New York or Boston, you're going to get a job as the television commentator in the 1950s? No. Right, you're from the Deep South, you're going to get a job as a television commentator? <coughs> Guess where almost all the people on the national news came from? Yeah, the Midwest. If you're from Indiana, Ohio, where you really don't have an accent, you don't have a southern accent, you don't have that Brooklyn accent or that Boston accent, and back at that time period, if you wanted to go on the news, that's where they kind of look for people that were from the Midwest. 
Um, today we kind of it's, it's we're, we're it's, it's actually it's, it's kind of strange that I've, I've seen in my lifetime a lot more accepting if you have a soft southern accent. Uh, the New York and Boston Boston accents aren't accepted uh, there. That's kind of seen as too harsh a lot of times. But this is where um, I kind of started seeing it in the 90s, where if they have a soft southern accent, and part of this was CNN being in Atlanta, uh, making a difference. All right, radio, rock and roll emerges. We have Elvis Presley. Thank goodness that Forrest Gump was able to go and teach him how to dance. Okay, he's kind of an example. Anything to do with the youth culture with there with rock and roll? All right, think about rock and roll as a mixture of the African American, the rhythm and blues that we have, and then basically the white country music. Okay, is a mixture of those type of beats that come together. Um, and it is something that's seen as very American. Okay, I mean it was our own music that we that we come out. All right, the payola scandal. The idea of the payola scandal, what was happening is where people were buying at that time, you would buy records. LPs were the big records that, that you would have, and then you would have the smaller 45s that would have a song, one song on both sides, and you could get those on there. I know for some of you with the vinyl records, all right, that's definitely an antique. Um, that, should, that should look at. But what happened was DJs were being, for the payola scandal, were being paid under the table to try to promote things, and when people would hear it, they would, they would go out and then buy the, the 45s, the record companies were doing it, instead of where the DJs were supposed to be seen as, let's choose and try to find new music. Um, all right, why did Americans have more leisure time? They weren't working as many hours. All right, technology. All right, technology, we made things. The video that you watched yesterday, what um, what was the time saved by the new washing machines? Six hours. Yeah, like, like two hours. Family wash went from six hours to 45 minutes. Okay. Right. Think of all these new appliances and everything for cooking. You combine that with, they have more money. More time, more money, what you gonna do? You gonna spend it, do all the things that you want. Get in trouble. Uh, but here. And here's where we have some things. I have all your sports grow. Now, passive sports. Passive sports would be like football, baseball. <coughs> they say that's not passive, especially when you compare it to bowling. <laughs> but how many people are going out and truly playing football compared to what people are bowling? And actually, if you all really want to, probably the show that you all have seen the most of the 1950s culture is, watch the Flintstones. Okay. Is that a traditional marriage? Um, yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Husband and wife. Wife staying at home. Friends going to work at the at uh, the Search rock quarry. Okay. Instead of driving a car. Yes. Well, really, that does have the car, but it's powered by his feet. <laughs> okay. But yeah. But that's where you kind of look at. Fred goes bowling. Okay. They go to the movie theater. The drive-in movie theater, which was something else bigger in the nineteen. 50s. Um, um, hunting, fishing actually is something that grew up that time. I mean, this is where a lot of people kind of remember going to grandfather's, grandpa's farm or something like that. TV, got it. And, and there became bigger. We had that in the other section, but dime stores, shopping came in. And this is where we have um, the very first for Waltons and what was later on for Walmart, where he kind of would learn all right, what people want. Okay, and this idea that you would have in there. People going on vacations where we have that on the other section. So um, I'm going to go ahead and stop that part. We're almost done. So I'm going to go ahead and stop. People that you do need to know Dr. Spock and Dr. Salk. Spock is not from the Enterprise. Okay? Um, and what he wrote is a book, and you see up there Baby and Child Care. And he gave his philosophy, and we had an entire generation that was raised, the baby boomers. A lot of people change, change the way that they raise children. Your parents probably use a lot of the philosophies that Dr. Spock wrote about. Um, I will say that, I mean, I can almost make a bet that probably at least three quarters of you in here that if you're the oldest child or whoever was the oldest child in your family, that somebody probably bought Dr. Spock's more updated version on there. Some of you, 
when it's a timeout. <laughs> so you spend a lot of time in timeout. Yeah, and that was part of the idea of Dr. Spock. Instead of basically, you did something wrong, all right, you're spanking. I got both. Okay, it still didn't do any good for me. Um, and, uh, but this is where, and it, it actually, in later editions, Dr. Spock would have to readjust and would say, or originally was saying that you should do spanking, he would say, well, in certain situations that maybe you should, there are cases that it is acceptable for a parent to do that. But a lot of people, now here's where the effect comes in. Our baby boomers would be that generation that would end up being our hippies. And some people would say, well, is this something that contributed to it? All right, we went a lot less on our discipline. Um, other people will look and say, it's a generation that was basically a spoiled generation. They were the richest in American history up to that time, although generations after that were richer. Okay, but this is where, you can't say it, but this one, for sure which one it was, but that's where parts of it could be. All right, Dr. Stalk. Most people don't know of his name today. Polio affected a higher percentage of people in the 1930s and 40s than cancer does today. Dang. Do you think if you were a doctor and you basically made a vaccine that got rid of cancer, do you think that you would go down in history? Yeah. yeah. And this is where we kind of forget about it because, well, polio is almost eradicated throughout the world. Uh, that's one of the things Bill Gates has spent a lot of spent a lot of money of, of his own to try to get it for some of the last few places that polio um, in Asia, the Middle East, and Africa, that, that some places that try to make sure that they vaccinate and get polio eradicated uh, from the world. But this is where Dr. Salk, kind of with this vaccine, um, have. today most people don't even think of him because we don't think of polio. But that's where again you kind of take it in the context of cancer um, and what. He did with changing the world. Um, all right, organized religion. Why did people, and this is why I have it there, sometimes it's referred to as a great awakening. Why did people become more religious in the 1950s? Nothing else to do. Nothing else to do. They have TV, they have sports, they have extra money. More they got rid of churches. prohibition, like, so they got to find something else. They want to get together, like, you know, they want to <laughs> okay, well, you were sort of right in the beginning. What did you say, Taylor? They got rid of prohibition, so they got to get something else for them. No, no uh, the prohibition has yeah. been away for a while. Here's where we look. You take other factors into it. The baby boom. Do sometimes people decide when they were going, when they were first married, ah, oh, we're not going to go to church. But then they decide when they have kids, want the kids going to church. Yeah. So the baby boom will affect this. Also, what's going on internationally and politically during the 1950s that some people might think, this could be the end of the world. Cold War. Yeah, the Cold War. And is that sometimes in the back of people's minds? All right, what if this is? Uh, we find that we had another great awakening in the 1990s. Uh, and this is where some people will look at things and say that even though so people that think, okay, the millennium was going to be the end of the world, some people kind of let me hedge your bets. Oh, well, maybe I better get to church a little more often. Um, but Dylan, when you were talking, though, it was you were kind of in the right direction, but this also kind of goes with the idea of status and conformity. You joined the church so that you could be part of their elders. All right, It was something that you were supposed to do. If you're in a middle class town, you join the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church. And it also gave you an identity. Uh, and one thing that we find, though, and this is where the 1920s comes in, we had it in the 1950s. Some people will say we have it happening again today. As we have one group of the population become more religious, we have another group become less religious. And kind of we end up having that divide between them. Did people um, have children a lot younger back then than this was socially acceptable now? Because I know my grandma had hers at like 19 and like 17, Here, 18. And here's what's like kind of normal. where it's kind of strange is, and this is what it's right now, it's kind of weird. We have two, it's almost, it seems like today we have two groups. We have those that are a lot more that are having it younger, and then we have them older. 
I mean, in the 1950s, where there are many women in their upper 30s and 40s having their first child. Yeah. But you'll hear a lot of career women and, and women that did that. Meanwhile, I mean, it's and it gla we've seen we are having more teen pregnancies now than we had in the last couple generations. So, there the, the average age all right, might be higher now, but we don't seem to have where a lot of people look and say, okay, when you got to your 20s and early 30s, is when most women would have children. Because uh, they can you, see sometimes they would have they get married at. Right, and I, my mother did that. My mother got married. My mother got married one weekend and graduated from high school the next. Yeah, I mean, I mean that was, I mean that was part. I mean, and there were people, people that did that. Part of this goes into that whole conformity idea, also though, uh, because if you were to do what was seen as a, the family, are you supposed to get married? Did you live together? What happened if a high school girl got pregnant in the 1950s? She disappeared. <laughs> she did disappear. She All right. Married. What? She got married. Well, she's old enough to go marry, but what if the guy's nowhere around? Her they keep her in the house. This is where like, the classic example was she went to take care of her sick aunt someplace else. So it wouldn't shame the family. So if you were here in Inverness, all right, you get pregnant. Your family doesn't want that to be known. So send you off to your aunt in Atlanta and you'll have the kid there. And that was kind of what a lot of times people do. There was a shame attached to that than for the family. And again, it goes to that and this is theme of conformity. Okay, you, um, and some of the social norms that should happen here. All right, churches. All right, women's roles. Yeah. What's polio? What? Let's, all right. With polio, and I, to give you kind of the, the easiest that I can get, you'll end up having it where you could die from it, and, and it's it's probably the closest thing that I kind of look at today for a lot of times the results would be like encephalitis, where you will end up, um, you might survive encephalitis, but polio, a lot of times you would survive it, but you would be paralyzed, like Franklin Roosevelt was the example that. Um, he, had, he had spinal damage then from that, and it's, you get from the fevers from it, and that's why encephalitis sometimes will have that happen today um, there. But that's why some people would survive it, but you would be paralyzed or partly paralyzed from it along the way. So, in your body? Yeah, and pretty much of, of the brain and spine, nervous system is how it would go. All right, women's role for the most part, 1950s, traditional role. And yeah, this is where TV played into that. <laughs> Those that worked, and there were a lot of women that still worked, but their pay was less. No longer was it where we had the executive order in World War II that if you're in, in the military industry, you got paid the same as, as a man that you had. Now, I have on here the early feminist movement was brewing. The show, I Love Lucy. I, the, the classic 1950s sitcom. Now, Lucy was married, uh, and, she, and this is where for her and her husband, and realistically, if you want to look at things in here, I Love Lucy is a, the same version that you would have of the Flintstones. <laughs> okay, I mean, and there are so many things that are alike uh, there, and a lot of the same stories were on the Flintstones that were on I Love Lucy. But you have the idea of the star of the show is actually a woman, and a woman as a comedian. Is that breaking some barriers? Um, and also, this is where the show also kind of broke some barriers. All right, she, um, her husband in real life and then on the show is Desi Arnaz, who is a Cuban-American, so for a minority. So it kind of broke. I mean, even though he is white Cuban, it kind of broke through what were, were some of the differences that you would have. But Lucille Ball, using it in a comedic way, was one that would kind of show, all right, that women and stand up for different things for women uh, that they have. Now, a little side thing this is where TV comes in also. The first time on TV that you had a man and a woman seen in bed. There's there are oh. two different shows on the same weekend, so which one truly came first, I don't know, because it depends on when that book air, air, aired it. One was on the Flintstones. But if you watch most of the old Flintstones, they are in separate beds. 
And even on the TV shows back in the 50s, husband and wife were in a separate bed. But on the Lucille Ball show, and or I Love Lucy, there was a scene one time where they were in bed together. And this is where they were pushing the limits for the F FCC. Well, I thought it was illegal originally. If you weren't married in well, real life, you couldn't... Well, and this is where they were pressing the, the issue. And even though they were in bed together, it was kind of as a joke because they pulled out the covers and they're fully clothed. Hmm. Think about how we have TV today. Any changes now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's just what, but that was pressing the issue at that time. Um, and it's been, been said for feminist movement. This is where Lucille Ball was kind of doing, doing that and using TV. And that's why and I'm, that's what I'm trying to get to it for when you look at it. It's not just here's the SFI, here's what goes with it. How do all these things kind of get connected? And then we will have these movements in the next generation. All right, the beatniks. Uh, a lot of times you'll see, like, this is kind of the stereotypical fashion of the beatniks. And then they're going to get their drums, and they're going to be beating on the drum. But in the 1950s, we'll have a group of writers, artists, musicians, uh, that were against conformity. Uh, some of the writers you need to know, to know of and be familiar with is Ginsburg, Kerak, and Salinger. And you'll notice in there the word conformity, conformity, conformity. Yeah. Isn't there like a lot like the law of there? And I'm glad you pointed that out because is history repeating itself? Mm -hmm. 1920s, we have our lost generation writers that are criticizing the materialism and conformity of the 1920s. And what are the beatniks writing about? The same thing. All right, materialism and conformity. So they're kind of look, looking at that. Uh, each in their own different fashion, but this is where you'd have to Now, the beatniks are realistically, they'll be the hippies before it becomes really cool. <laughs> Uh, and a lot of these artists would go together in an area of San Francisco um, called the Haight-Ashbury District. We'd also have in New York City, Greenwich Village. And then these would be kind of the start of a lot of things when we would have our flower children. Uh, but we'll see that it goes from more of this idealistic later on to maybe not so idealistic with the beatniks on there. Um, David Reisman is a sociologist. He is one that studies society. And what he found was that the individualism was being replaced with what? Conformity. Conformity in the 1950s. Now, here's what it doesn't have to do with conformity, and you're going to see this guy pop up again and again. Michael Harrington would write a book called The Other America. And he would show that what you were watching on TV maybe wasn't what was happening everywhere. This affluence that all these middle class families were getting wasn't being spread all over. If you were in Inverness, Florida in 1955, do you think that you got the benefits of everything that was happening, affluence and money wise, in the 1950s? Because we Inverness was a rural area. We're, we're semi rural now, all right? We're not truly suburban, but we're definitely not a rural area. At that time, it was. It was a small town. I mean, it's, and so they did, we did not have our suburbs. Uh, for TVs, yeah, you could get some TV and you get a reception. This is why you kind of see that thing where people have the joke about having to go up and turn the antenna. All right, you'd have to kind of face it. All right, we're going to turn the antenna and, and turn it towards Gainesville or turn it towards Orlando or Tampa. Okay, you had to probably get a really high antenna in order to get some of the stations there. And it is. And I, this is where I'm glad you're seeing these connections with these writers. And where the other half lives and our other muckrakers, we would have the progressive movement come from this. In the 1960s, we're going to have first JFK, but although JFK might have a great reputation now, or people think of him, people, Congress didn't listen to JFK. But our next president, Lyndon Johnson, would take a lot of things that said what's wrong in our cities inner cities and what's wrong with our rural area, we got to fix that. And Lyndon Johnson would actually do a lot of things, what was called the Great Society Program. So the Great Society Programs are a lot like the progressivism reaction that you would have. Uh, and he'll come up when we have that section, he'll come up again. But this is where a very influential book in American history there. So 
All right, so that's the end of it.